All right, good evening. I'd like to start out by thanking everybody for coming this evening and introducing myself. My name is Maria Fogarasi. Although having said that, you should know that in Hungary, the last name always comes first and the pronunciation is different. So I would be Fogarasi Maria if we were in Hungary, almost sounding like a completely different person. I had the good fortune to visit, or I have had the good fortune to visit Budapest many times, and even the better fortune to live there for five and a half years, from February of 95 until June of 2000, when my husband, who was with the Foreign Service, was posted to the U.S. Embassy there. He served the Department of Commerce overseas for 30 years. And so we had five and a half years in the land of his heritage. Fogarashi is a Hungarian name. It's actually a mountain range and a town in Transylvania, which was part of Hungary up until 1920. This is my presentation. We had many visitors and I loved to give tour guides and now I'm doing it in a different, in a different manner. So welcome to Budapest, Hungary, the Pearl of the Danube, the Hungarian flag at the top. Uh, the origins started around 1848 when the Hungarian Revolution, uh, they rose up against the Habsburgs in protest and therefore we have the three stripes akin to the French tricolor. The Hungarian stripes are red, white, and green, which stand for, it is said, the red being courage or strength, the white being faithfulness, the green being hope, or if you'd like to look at it in a more poetic sense, you could say that the red would be the blood which was shed for the fatherland, the white for freedom, and the green for the green pastures of Hungary. You have in the middle of the flag the, um, the insignia, which is uh, based of St. Stephen's crown on the top. You'll be hearing a lot about St. Stephen's crown that was put back onto the flag after communist rule ended and Hungary gained its freedom. So let's start. Uh, let's start by looking just exactly to see where it is in Europe. I would imagine many of you know, but it's uh, pretty much central Europe right there. And, uh, and by the way, um, uh, Magyar Orsag, Orsag at the top means country in Hungarian, the country of the Magyars, the original tribes who came in to settle Hungary. Um, Hungarians are Magyars and Magyarul would be the language. So if you see that word, uh, you'll know exactly what it means. Here is a little closer look at Hungary. Hungary has seven, seven neighbors uh, currently and probably stay that way. Uh, Ukraine, Slovakia, uh, Austria, Slovenia, Croatia, uh, Serbia, and Romania. And please note this, uh, I want you to see down here the Adriatic Sea. This will be important in a minute because Hungary was not always this size. This is what happened to Hungary after World War I. Hungary had been allied with Austria and as the successor state to Austria, they, were, um, they received a very heavy punishment when the terms of the, armistice, the agreement were, were hammered out between the Allies and, and Hungary. They lost 28%, no, they remained with 28% of their pre-war territory of land and they remained with 36% of their pre-war population. So a huge, a huge, as you, can, as you can see from that, those percentages, a huge number of uh, both, well, land and population was lost. The major beneficiaries of the agreement were, the, um, were Romania, the Kingdom of Serbia, and Czechoslovakia up here. The Treaty of Trianon was hammered out in Paris. There is a smaller palace behind Versailles, which is called Trianon, and this is where the Allies decided to dictate the terms to Hungary. There were no negotiations. They had to accept what was given to them. It was a bitter blow for the country, and the treaty was signed on June the 4th, 1920. They also had to pay war reparations to their neighbors, and they became a landlocked country. They, their army was limited to 35,000 troops and they uh, no longer had a navy because they no longer had access to the port on the Adriatic. This is a very bitter, bitter memory for Hungarians. Uh, this would have been Greater Hungary prior to 1920, just once more so you can see the area around it and just the size that the country uh, was back then. And this is how Hungarians my understanding is how they feel a bit about the Treaty of Trianon, that all this land was taken from them, and it's, it's, a, it's a bitter memory. 
And this is a, this is a slogan from Treaty of Trianon. This is a, actually a crown of thorns up here around the present day country. And uh, no, no, never again would be the slogan, never to lose this territory. When I said that my name was Fogarashi and it came from Romania, from Transylvania, I, um, that was part of Hungary that is not Hungary anymore, it's Romania. So, but we're going to forget that for now. We're going down to um, take a look at Budapest. That's the topic of the presentation. And I would like to point out a couple of things here. First of all, Buda is uh, on this side of the river and Buda is the hilly side of the river. There are two, um, two, two theories as to where the, the name came from. One could be uh, Bleda, the brother of Attila the Hun, who came in the, around the seventh or eighth century but I think it's more likely that it comes from the, the Latin word voda, from water, because the Romans were here and there are thermal hot springs and the Romans always liked to have their outposts and their provinces where there was plenty of bathing water. So that would be Buda. And just to the north that you don't see up here is another little town called Obuda. This over here is Pest or Pest. It would be in English, the S is pronounced S-H. So Budapest would be Budapest in Hungarian. And it's believed that the word Pest comes from an old Slavic word meaning oven or furnace, possibly to do with the side that, that was be the side where the industry developed. So people always think that Buddha and Pest came together in 1873, but really it was Obuda, Buddha, and Pest. So it was three cities that united to form this beautiful city on the Danube. The Danube is the second longest river in Europe after the Volga. It flows through 10 countries, more than any other country in the world, and it originates in Germany's Black Forest and flows uh, at a southeast angle, emptying into the Black Sea. It flows for about 1,800 miles. So you couldn't have this city without, uh, without the river and without the beautiful bridges that span it. And a tribute to the Hungarian language, just one quickly before we contribute, before we continue. It is a language unlike any other. It's not an easy language to learn, but this, um, this writer wants to um, portray it on a language tree. So we'll go for just a second and we see here the Indo-European languages that we know with English and German and up here you've got Hindi and Bengali. But over here you have the Ural Altaic languages and you've got Hungarian and Finnish and Estonian, which are all related at the root. The uh, predecessors of Finland, Estonia, and Hungary originally, they came from what is now Russia, but about 1000 BC they split, and um, obviously the, um, the, uh, the pre pre predecessors of uh, Finland and Estonia went further north, and the uh, Hungarians, or the Magyar tribes, came over the Carpathian Mountains and into the basin. Their leader was Arpad. They conquered the eastern half of what we now know as Hungary in 896 AD, and then moved westward, and by 900 AD, the tribes had united, and this forms present-day Hungary. So 896 is considered the year that Hungary was formed, and the birth year. And here you see a close-up, and I probably should have done that previously, but you've got Hungarian there, Finnish, and Estonian, and some other dialects. They're not in any way alike in the spoken word, but they are related at the, in the grammatical structure. They're all three um, challenging to try and learn, but beautiful each and every way. So the first thing that you want to see when you go to Budapest and that you definitely shouldn't miss is the parliament. And some of you may recognize this from the Viking cruise brochures. It's a very famous motif. It is uh, Budapest, the largest building in Budapest, the third largest parliament building in the world, and the highest building in Budapest, the spire of the dome reaching up 96 meters. In the 1880s, there was a contest held to design this building to uh, give Hungary sovereignty. You should also know that when in the 1848 revolution, when they presented their petitions to the Habsburgs, they were unsuccessful, but then Austria lost bitterly in 1866 in the war against Prussia. So they had to turn to Hungary to keep their dynasty and their empire going. And so there was a compromise, a uh, Hungarian-Austrian compromise reached in 1867. It didn't give Hungary full independence like much of the population would have liked, but it gave it partial independence. So in 1880, 
this parliament building was up for architectural competition and the winner was a gentleman named Imre Steindl who modeled it after the parliament building in London and created an absolutely gorgeous building. He unfortunately it was finished in 1902. It played a big part in the 1896 millennial exhibition, the 1000 year of the anniversary commemorating the founding of the Hungarian state. Remember I had said 896, this would be 1896. He passed away before 1982 and he had um, been blind so he didn't see it being finished. But you have to um, book a tour in the parliament or, or you'll be sorry. So this building has 691 rooms, it has 10 courtyards and it has 12.5 miles of stairways in it. And when you book the tour, you can see some of the um, upper, upper hall, and you can see the, uh, the stairway, which is carpeted in red velvet. And you can see also the chamber where they keep the coronation jewels. Let me try and get a close-up for you. The coronation jewels are what you saw on the flag when you looked at the insignia of the country. You saw St. Stephen's crown. This crown was probably made around 1070 AD. The enamels on it are all Byzantine. We think, or history believes, that it was probably made in Constantinople. And it was the king of, it was the crown of Stephen who brought Christianity, brought Christianity into the country. He developed bishoprics and archbishoprics and monasteries independent of the Church of Rome. He widely encouraged the spread of Christianity and there were severe punishments for those who did not carry it out. But he was a very benevolent king. He was very well loved and his reign was very peaceful. He died in 1083 and Hungary at that time was a very popular route for people passing through from east to west going on to visit the Holy Lands or Constantinople. This crown has had a very lively history. It has been lost, stolen, recovered, um, taken out of the country a couple of times and in for instance in 1945 it was discovered by the US Army the 86th uh, Army Infantry Division in Matze in Austria and it was taken to the United States for safekeeping Um, for safekeeping and kept at Fort Knox along with other precious jewels and the U.S. gold reserves. In 19, prior to 1978, there was a great deal of research done to verify the authenticity of the crown. And during the presidency of Jimmy Carter in January of 1978, it was given back to Hungary, but I have to be very careful here. There was a great deal of political debate beforehand, and the stipulation was such that it was given back to the Hungarian people and not to the communist government, which was in power at that time. So this is the crown of St. Stephen, and there's the, there's the orb. Uh, what is not on display is the coronation mantle because it's very, very frail, and it is in the National Museum in a special uh, climate-controlled climate uh, um, case. It, when, when, the, when the crown jewels were given back to Hungary, they were in the National Museum, but about 20 years ago they moved to Parliament, which seems to be very fitting. No one really knows why the cross on the top is bent. Um, it must have happened at some point through history, but Hungarians feel that in a way, no one's try, ever tried to change it back or correct it, and Hungarians feel that it distinguishes this crown from other crowns and also signifies the turbulent history that Hungary has had over over hundreds of years. This would be King Stephen here wearing with the crown on his head and uh, um, he, was, he was canonized in, in 1083 along with his son and his, uh, his bishop. This is a statue of King Stephen up on the Buddha side of the, of the, uh, of the river and uh, wearing uh, a coat of uh, chain mail there and again with the crown and the cross. It's a very, very handsome, handsome statue. And this is St. Stephen's crown on a um, banknote issued by the National Bank of Hungary, the Magyar Nemzeti Bank. Hungary is a member of the European Union, but Hungary does not have the euro. They use the forint, F-O-R-I-N-T. You can see it right over here. And these, these banknotes were, were uh, um, put into circulation around the year 2000 and then taken out again 
uh, in 2007. So again, just showing the reverence that the people have for St. Stephen's crown. So, and here it is once again, you can see it more closely up on the flag and on so many motifs that have anything to do with the country. This gentleman right here is standing on a bridge made out of uh, tank treads and he's gazing off to the side. His name is Imre Naj or it would be Naj Imre in Hungarian. He had been prime minister in 1953 and became prime minister again, uh, the leader of a de facto coalition government in 1956 when Hungary thought that it could rise up against the Soviets and regain a measure of freedom for itself. You have to remember that after World War II, the Cold War had drawn the Iron Curtain across Central and Eastern Europe. Hungary was part of this, and Imre Naj immediately, immediately uh, announced a more liberal kind of a regime for his people. He wanted to encourage the manufacture of consumer goods. He wanted to uh, lessen the harsh realization of the uh, collectiv collecti collectivization of land that had gone on. He wanted to free the political prisoners and in general make conditions better for the working man. Unfortunately, the other thing that he wanted to do, which he announced on the 1st of November, was take Hungary out of the Warsaw Pact and become a neutral nation. And it was at this point where Moscow uh, said absolutely not, with the, with the thought that if Hungary did this and they allowed this to happen, the others could follow suit, Poland, East Germany, Bulgaria, and the tanks rolled into the capital city. It was a very bitter, bitter battle. So this would have been on October 23rd, starting for about 10 days. The Hungarians fought very bravely, but they didn't have a chance against the Soviet tanks. Uh, the city, the capital city was heavily damaged. No help ever came from any other country, unfortunately. And uh, thousands were executed and hundreds of thousands more fled the country for their lives. So Imre Naj himself was executed for his actions in 1958. It was not announced at the time. He simply disappeared from the history pages. No one ever talked about him until Hungary regained its freedom when they found his, his grave in the remote corner of a cemetery and he was reinterred with uh, honors and given credit for what he had done. He um, is actually just very, very close to the parliament building. You can see another view of him here. He's actually gazing at the parliament building and this is symbolic of the fact that he brought the country halfway to democracy, but he didn't quite make it there. The bridge is made out of tank treads to symbolize, symbolize uh, the power and the might that didn't, didn't, quite, didn't quite succeed. He was succeeded by a man Moscow put into place in the leadership of Hungary named Janos Kadar. Kadar was to remain in power all the way through up until we always use the term until the, the wall fell, the Berlin Wall fell, and Hungary regained its freedom. He also realized the need for a slightly less repressive regime and he was able to convince Moscow of his way of steering Hungary through the Cold War years. So Hungary was always known as a country that was slightly more liberal than the other countries behind the Iron Curtain. A uh, great deal of tourism in Hungary. They had good relations with the West. Travel restrictions, I have to be careful because this is to a degree, were slightly uh, easier to gain for, not to say that they could all leave the country whenever they wanted to, but it was certainly easier than hardline Bulgaria or East Germany. And uh, um, so Qatar stayed in power until 1990. But this is the tribute to Imre Naj. When this, when this was built, it was in 1996, at the same time when my husband was inaugurating a new commercial service office, which was a block away from our embassy. And First Lady Hillary Clinton had visited at that time. She laid a wreath at the feet of, of Mr. Naj and then also cut the ribbon in my husband's office. So that's always exciting to have any kind of that visitor come and, and uh, everything that happens around it. So moving on here, we're coming to Freedom Square, which is also, as you can see, there's Parliament. So this is all very, very close proximity and still on the Pest side of the river. This is a liberation or freedom monument that was erected to the Soviets for thanking them for liberating the country from Nazi Germany in 1945. Of course, it was soon to turn into a different kind of non-liberalization for Hungary. But this, has, this was erected to the Soviets in thanks for the fatherland. Um, 
one side note is that when we lived there, um, Evita was filmed in the, the city of Budapest, and this whole area was covered with palm trees to make it look like Buenos Aires, but it doesn't normally look like that. This is, this is Freedom Square with that monument. This is a monument that was put up fairly recently in 2014 to the victims of German oppression during the war. You can see the Archangel Gabriel there uh, protecting an innocent Hungary and the orb with the year 1944 there. There were massive, massive protests when this was erected because some people felt there, the, um, the Hungarian government uh, had, had cooperated fully with the Nazi government and some people felt that this was saying absolving the Hungarian government at that time, led by Admiral Horthy, of any blame of, of responsible for the death for about one million of its citizens, including two-thirds of its Jewish population. So, but it was put up in 2014, but there was a great deal of controversy about it. This man is not at all controversial. This is Harry Hill Bandholtz. He's an American Army officer and he was with the Inter-Allied War Commission after in 1919, 1920, and what he's best remembered for is standing at the door of the Hungarian National Museum, armed with only his riding crop, which is behind his back here, and preventing the museum from having been looted. So in gratitude to him, excuse me, gratitude to him, they, uh, they've put this statue up on Freedom Square. And then one more statue, which was not there when we were living there, but this is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan did not visit um, Budapest during his presidency, but he was known for that famous statement, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall, and the Hungarians put it up in gratitude for him, for his place in history, and uh, for obviously having to implement all these dominoes falling, and then the, the, uh, um, the freedom of Hungary once again. This would have been Secretary of State at the time, Condoleezza Rice, and this gentleman is Viktor Orban, who is the current Prime Minister of Hungary. So this is the unveiling of the Reagan statue, and he also, um, you can just see him right here, he also has uh, the Parliament building in the background. So quite a bit on this one square to see. Um, so many different tributes. Uh, the American Embassy is also on this square, it's off to one side, I didn't choose to show it in this presentation. So we're moving on to St. Stephen's Cathedral, again in honor of St. Stephen, the first Christian king of Hungary, and also I think completed around 1905. And the spire on this church is 96 meters tall. I had mentioned that Parliament is the tallest building in the city of Budapest. The spire is 96 meters. Well, this is also 96 meters, and that was done intentionally. Remember the 896, the founding of Hungary, and it was supposed to symbolize that worldly and religious um, significance of equal importance in the world. It's an absolutely gorgeous church inside. Over the entrance, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the light in Latin. And this would be um, a picture of the interior. There are just so many ornate buildings in Budapest, one after the other, all of them built within this time frame, 1880, uh, 1900, 1910. And, uh, um, uh, it is said that the, um, the uh, holy right hand of King Stephen is one of the relics in, in, this, um, in this cathedral here, which, um, which is the largest church in Budapest, and St. Stephen's feast day is August 20th. Hungary has three national holidays. August 20th is probably the highest holiday with fireworks over the Danube. Uh, just, uh, just for a moment here, you can't see the church very well, but you can see the, uh, the light show on it. This would be during the Advent season. So Germany isn't the only one that has perfected the Christmas market. So Hungary has, for instance, one of its um, big Christmas markets right in front of St. Stephen's Cathedral at the Advent time. And this is another one, which is on another square, but just to show you the little booths set up and the lighting and the atmosphere at that time. And what do you want to do at a Christmas market? You want to, one thing you want to do is eat and try the local specialties. And this would be langosh, this would be the, the, the yeast dough that's dropped into hot um, bubbling oil and fried to a perfect crisp, which you can then rub with garlic and sprinkle with salt, or you can put sour cream and cheese on it. You don't travel to Hungary when you're on any kind of a diet <laughs> because you don't have any fun. And these would, this would be the, the famous stuffed cabbage rolls that you could buy at the Christmas market. And then, of course, you'd have all kinds of grilled meat. 
and these would be some of the Christmas souvenirs that you might find there. So just a little sidetrack there, moving away from St. Stephen's Cathedral. We're moving on to another uh, square also on the Pesht side, but I want to pay tribute to the National Porcelain. It's a very Herond from the town of Herond out in the western part. I, well, Budapest is fairly west, but this is probably about two, three hours from the town of Budapest. Um, Heron is the national porcelain. It's exquisite. It's, uh, it's hand painted. It is, uh, has a gold gilding around the edge, and it was privatized again after Hung Hungary regained its freedom. When we lived there, all these pieces were out on display in the store, but I can imagine there were just too many visitors, and they've put them all in showcases now. I did take a picture of one of the sets. You can see the gilding uh, around the edges and just beautiful, beautiful motifs. Herond is also known for the, the little, uh, little animals and the, um, the way the, the, the pattern of the painting on it is very unique to Herond. So if you ever see those anywhere, you'll know what you're looking at. And then this would be a dancing hussar from times of old, another one of their, another one of their productions. So the square right next to um, Herond is, is called Vyroshmarty Square. It's named after the poet Vyroshmarty. There he is. This is a statue with uh, um, people listening to his readings. And of course, a summer day, you've got people sitting around the edge. What I want to point out on this square is this absolutely gorgeous coffee house. The name of it is Gerbo. Hungary, Budapest has beautiful, beautiful coffee houses where the writers and the politicians would gather and discuss all the matters of the day. Gerbo inside has the chandeliers from the idea of Maria Theresia of Vienna. It has imported woods paneling its walls. It's got a bit of the Louis XIV look to it. And uh, most tourists at some point in time will end up in one of these coffee houses. So you could theoretically start with Gerbo. And there you can see some of the delicacies that you can choose. You really don't know where to start when you're ordering. I want to also pay tribute to this cake. There is a pastry called Gerbo, but I wanted to point out the Dobosch Torte because it has an interesting background. So Dobosch, Dobosch, Josef Dobosch was a baker, and he wanted to devise a cake that possibly um, kept the moisture in and was, not, was more impervious to the climate because the cooling methods at that time were were not you know, as sophisticated as we have today. So apparently underneath the chocolate icing here, he has a layer of crushed nuts. They could be walnuts or almonds or hazelnuts. And on the top, the Café Gerbeau has sliced this, but he had just a very plain circular um, thin caramel crust at the top. He also used buttercream inside the cake, which was not widely known at that time, but he had traveled in France. He then promoted this cake throughout Europe. It would have been introduced around 1896 for the Millennial Exhibition. Kaiser Franz Josef of Austria, who would have also been crowned in Hungary, remember Austria and Hungary, and his wife Elizabeth would have been at that exhibit and possibly some of the first people to taste the Dobosch cake. He promoted it throughout Europe. He would then mail it out in little wooden boxes. There have been attempts to recreate it and imitate it, but as legend goes, uh, no one's ever been able to do that. So a tribute to uh, Joseph Dobosch. I think he's got something like eight or nine eggs in this, in this cake. Um, this is the opera. We're heading uh, out away from the part of Pesh that's closest to the river now. Again, just a beautiful, stunning building, very ornate. Again, more red velvet inside. And what you're doing is going up a street called Andrashi, which is named after um, the statesman, uh, Count Andrashi. And you're seeing beautiful, beautiful facades of buildings, homes, some businesses, but mostly residential. As of 2002, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And Andrashi will take you all the way up to Hero Square. So you could walk up Andrashi, or you could choose to ride the little Fuldalati, which is an underground and which is after two in the United Kingdom, the oldest underground system on continental, in continental Europe, and um, little cable cars underneath. Budapest has four subway lines altogether, but the other three are simply called Metro, Metro 1, 2, and 3, and this one is literally Fuldalati, underneath the earth. Um, just like anywhere in the world with public transportation, you have to watch out for those pickpockets. They seem to know who the tourists are and when they're distracted, and they are just incredibly fast. 
So this is the little food alati you could take if you chose to go up to Hero Square. And this is where you would disembark. This is, again, a tribute uh, to the millennial celebration of Hungary. You've got the angel Gabriel at the top. You have seven, here they are, the seven chieftains, the Magyars who came into the Carpathian Basin. And going back for just a minute, when it was created, it was during the time of the Austria-Hungarian -Hungari monarchy. So the figures on this side would have been all Austrian um, royalty. But after World War II, they changed that. So the figures are now, um, they are, they are uh, all Hungarian, Hungarian heroes and figures from the past. Behind this column, people think, some people think that Hungary has a uh, tomb of the unknown soldier. They don't, but there is a monument behind this column, and there's an artesian well underneath it, and the well goes down 971 meters, and it actually feeds the Seicheni baths, which you'll see in a moment, which is a massive complex of thermal baths not so far away. Behind this is also the very large city park, all again on the Pest side, and again the chieftains there proudly displayed. And this is a restaurant right next to the, the city park, Gundel. Gundel is very famous. It's a five-star restaurant. It was founded years ago by Karoy Gundel, and after Hungary had freedom again, was purchased by Ronald Lauder, the son of Estee Lauder, the cosmetics queen, and George Lang, who was a very famous uh, restaurateur in New York City, who I believe owned the Four Seasons, and they brought it up to standard again. And when you are at Gundel, oh, Gundel is also right next to the zoo. So the symbol of the Gundel restaurant is the elephant, just like these two stone elephants at the entrance to the zoo. And it's just a beautiful interior and it's obviously very fine dining. You will most likely be serenaded by violin players. Uh, this is not only in Gundel, this is many places, also especially heavy with the um, tourist trade. This is not Gundel either, but I just wanted to show the musicians and uh, this gentleman here with his lone violin somewhere in a cafe. You might choose to order a bottle of Buena Vista wine when you're at Gundel. This is a tribute to Augustin Harasti, who was a Hungarian who emigrated to the United States, first to Wisconsin and then on to California, and is known actually as the modern father of California viticulture because he imported European um, uh, vines. And he was the founder of the Buena Vista uh, winery in, uh, in California. And this is the famous Gundel Palacinta. Again, the Palacinta is a dessert. It's a very similar, it's a very thin crepe. And Gundel has their own special style. And they've got this little piece of chocolate on the top. And again, you can see the elephants there. So you're guaranteed a fine meal if you, di if you dine at Gundel. And just one more tribute to George Lang. I don't know if you can read it here, but his autobiography is titled Nobody Knows the Truffles I've Seen, which I thought was a great play on the word troubles. Lang was born into a Jewish family in the town of Sekeshvervar, which is about an hour south of Budapest. His parents perished in Auschwitz, but he escaped from a labor camp and he joined the Hungarian Arrow Cross, which was the very vicious pro-Nazi organization at that time, and he was trying to disguise himself and hide, and he managed to hide for about three months before he was discovered. Then he was imprisoned. Then he was about to be put on trial with other Arrow Cross members, but the Soviets rolled into town and he was saved. So he was born, um, his last name was Deutsch when he was born, which means German. At that point, he had had enough of Hungary and he decided to emigrate to the United States. So he took his uh, mother's maiden name and became George Lang, and emigrated to New York and, uh, and made history there in the restaurant trade, George, tribute to George Lang. If you can't afford Gundel, you can go around the back, and this is a restaurant called the Owl's Castle, the Bagloivar, and they share the same kitchen with Gundel, so you're guaranteed also a good meal, maybe not at the five-star prices. And even if you don't eat at Gundel, if you ever go to Budapest, go at least into the entrance because they have pictures of famous people who've dined there. And it's, you, know, you can get a little bit of the atmosphere if your budget doesn't quite uh, measure up to its prices. So that's the Bagloivar. Uh, this is, these are the Seicheni Baths, named after Count Istvan Seicheni, who was a statesman. And they have 18 baths all together, 15 inside and three outside. It's a massive complex. It's absolutely gorgeous. And you have to think again that Budapest and its history of baths, 
the Romans looking for the thermals hot springs, then the Turks in the 15th, 16th century, and Turkish baths are also still in existence today. And now everything from our modern aqua therapies to mud packs to massages, whatever, whatever you want that has anything to do with the healing powers of water. Um, this would be the bath in one of the colder months. It's opened all year round where the steam is coming off the water. And I always love this motif of the men playing chess on the chessboard that extends out into the water. So the Seicheni Baths in the city park. This is the statue of Anonymous, who is said to be a middle-aged chronicler. And writers can touch his pen here for good luck and inspiration also in City Park. And we've left the City Park now, and we're still on the Pest side. And this is just one of my favorite cafes. This building houses the Cafe New York. And the Cafe New York was so beautiful when it opened around 1900 that it was said you should throw the key into the Danube so it would never, ever close. Again, writers, politicians, it's said that many of the newspapers of the day were being edited upstairs, would meet there. During the Cold War years, it fell into some disrepair. I read that at one point in time it was a sporting goods store, but again, it's been restored, and it's now directly adjacent to it is another five-star hotel, and it's now owned by, I think it's the Boscolo Palace, and uh, um, it's, just, uh, it's just a must. It's, it's, it's always on my, on my list for visitors to, uh, to Budapest. Not so far away, you'll find the Dohan Street synagogue, which is the second largest synagogue in the world after the one in New York City. And 3,000 people can fit into this synagogue. Um, exact construction was somewhere around 1850. Don't quote me on that. But after um, freedom came in the 90s, um, they went in with a $5 million gift from Estee Lauder, and they renovated the synagogue. There are so many tours that you can take in all of these cities. I, um, the, at least when I lived there, there was a, a tour, a Jewish tour of history that was very, very fascinating that, um, you know, that you can take. And there's so many parts about the synagogue you could show, but I just chose to show this, this weeping willow tree in the garden. And of course, it's not a real tree. These are, these are metal, uh, metal, metallic leaves with the names of Holocaust victims inscribed on them. I'd like to pay tribute to Raoul Wallenberg. He's one of my favorite figures in Hungarian history. He was not Hungarian. He was Swedish. He came from a very wealthy Swedish family. In fact, he studied architecture in Ann Arbor. And on the central campus of the University of Michigan, you can find a, a statue of him. But the reason why we're talking about him is that he was living in Hungary, and he was approached by the United States um, War Refugee Board as to whether or not he could help Jewish citizens. And he became very good at forging documents and passports for the Jews in Hungary. And it's estimated that he could have saved up to 100,000 lives. Very sadly, he was invited in, I think, July of 1945 to a meeting with the Soviets just outside the city. And he was never heard from again. No one knows what happens, despite massive attempts on the part of his family. Again, very wealthy family from Sweden and the rest of the world. But we, uh, we don't know. But he is um, a 32-cent US stamp here, a tribute to Wallenberg. And it says uh, the word humanitarian on the side of the stamp. This would be the National Museum, also on the Pest side. It would be here on the steps that uh, Petufi Shandor, or Shandor Petufi in English, would have stood in 1848 and read out the list of 12 demands he had written for the Habsburgs when, they, um, when, the, when the revolution got going. He also wrote uh, the national poem, which is called the Nemzeti Dal. And he read this on the streets of the National Museum to the masses who listened. And by the time he finished, they were chanting some of the repetitive verses over and over again and marching through the streets and seizing the presses and liberating political prisoners in their attempt to uh, rise up against the Habsburgs. It didn't work, but Petrofi Shandor, very, very um, revered in Hungarian history. And it was March 15th, 1848, where he stood there and he read that poem. So March 15th would be the third Hungarian holiday. So I had mentioned St. Stephen's Day on August the 20th. I had mentioned um, the October Revolution, which started on October 23rd. And March, March the 15th would be the third national holiday 
in Hungary. The National Museum, again, another, you know, it's just like I said, one after another, these absolutely exquisite buildings inside. So National Museum, and then we're going to cross over into uh, Buda. And how are we going to decide what to cross over? Because the city has some very beautiful bridges. I won't show them all, but I'll show you about five that are in the central part of the city. So this one is very, um, very, really plain and unadorned. And this is the Arpad Bridge, named after Arpad, who led the tribes, the chieftain who led the tribes into, into uh, settle the Magyar homeland. The second one is the Margaret Bridge. And this was named after a young woman who was the daughter of the Hungarian king during the Mongol invasion in 1251-1252. Uh, she was the ninth of ten children, and her father promised that he could, if he could overcome the Mongol invasion, he would give this child to God. Well, he was successful, so Margaret was sent to a Dominican monastery at the age of three to live with the sisters, and later on, she, there's an island, which you'll see in just a minute, right next to this bridge, which had always been called Rabbit Island. It had been a hunting ground for the kings. It's about 2.5 kilometers long. And at that time, there were many um, nunneries, cloisters, convents there. She was sent to live there, and she lived a very harsh life. She wore a hair shirt and was just constantly doing penance and uh, died at the age of 29. She has been canonized. The bridge and the island are named after her. This would have been, this is some of the more ornate decoration on the bridge. This would have been the bridge, well, the bridge was non-existent. This is at the end of World War II, but it's been restored. And this is Margaret Island here, this oblong piece of land. So you can get to Margaret Island from, uh, from the Margaret Bridge. And it's mostly recreational now, but you can see the ruins of the convent where Margaret lived. And it says ruins of a Dominican convent and church, uh, 12th, uh, 12th to the 16th centuries. And here lived St. Margaret of Hungary. And this man has nothing to do with the bridges, but you might recognize him as being Peter Falk or Columbo. So apparently the Hungarians loved the TV show Columbo. And he, Peter Falk, has a tiny bit of Hungarian heritage. So at the foot of the Margaret Bridge, somewhere on the Pest side right near there, you can find this statue of the detective with his cigar and his crumpled up raincoat, who always won every case he took on. And he's got his beloved Basset Hound at his feet there. So I had to, I had to put that in. So you're moving on, and you're coming to the first bridge, the first permanent bridge over the Danube, the Chain Bridge, or known as the Széchenyi Chain Bridge, again named for Count Istvan Széchenyi, the statesman who promoted its construction. And this is another one of the absolutely gorgeous uh, motifs or panorama motifs. You've got the parliament. This is all lit up at night. The bridge was constructed in um, 1849. It's a, it's a chain suspension bridge. It's been revered throughout history and said to have promoted um, any social, economic, cultural causes in Hungary. It gave new stature to the capital city. It, uh, um, it, uh, when GE bought uh, Tungsram, which was a Hungarian light bulb manufacturer, I don't know if you probably remember, but the GE used the uh, chain bridge in its advertisements on American television and used the slogan, GE lights up lights up Hungary. So the chain bridge, the engineer and the, the, the gentleman in charge of construction were, one was an Englishman, one was a Scotsman. They both had the last name of Clark. And this is the coat of arms again uh, at the tops of the uh, bridge where the cars are driving through. When we moved to Hungary in 1995, there were just pieces of cloth up here because during the communist years, there had been red stars up there. And they had removed the red stars, and they were in the process of putting the Hungarian coat of arms back up there. They are now in place. At the feet of the, uh, also, on the um, also on the Pest side, coming over to the Buddha side, there are two lions on each side of the bridge. And the sculptor was very proud of himself until someone told him, well, you didn't put the tongues in the mouths of the lion. And according to legend, he was ridiculed and teased for this. And he was very upset. And he said, come, let's go to the zoo. If you look at those lions, you wouldn't see their tongues hanging out of their mouths either. And then the, uh, the teasing continued. And he was finally said to uh, have quoted something like, well, you know, you 
you should wish that your wife would have a tongue like these lions, meaning that your wife would be quiet all the time. So legend also has it that he was so distraught about having forgotten the tongues that he threw himself into the Danube, but that's not true. He never threw himself into the Danube. So uh, those are the lions at the foot of the bridge. And um, this is the next bridge that we're coming to. The name of this bridge is Elizabeth Bridge. And I had mentioned the um, millennial exhibition where the Dobosch Torte might have been introduced and Franz Josef, the Kaiser, the, the emperor of Austria and also of Hungary, had a very young wife. Her name was Elizabeth. She grew up in Bavaria, a member of the Wittelsbach family. She was, in fact, a cousin of Ludwig II, who is responsible for building the fairy tale castle. Many of us know Neuschwanstein and two other castles. Um, Elizabeth had a very relaxed upbringing. So when she married Franz Josef and came to the very formal Vienna court, it was very difficult for her. And she wasn't happy there. She would escape to Hungary as often as she could. She taught herself Hungarian and lived in a little palace outside of the city by the name of Gudulu, which has also now been restored and which you can visit. She was very attractive. This is a statue of her on the Buddha side of the river, and this is more easy to see. This is her portrait. She had long hair. It took hours and hours to do her hair. She was affectionately, affectionately known by the nickname of Sissy, and it said during the time that she was doing her hair is when she would practice her Hungarian. So the bridge, um, remember it was white and it was very kind of slim in its, its construction and uh, um, named after uh, Elizabeth of Hungary. She, um, by the way, came to a very tragic end. Her son, her older son, committed suicide. Um, it was a, it was a, with his, with his mistress, it was a murder-suicide, and after that she only wore black, and then she was traveling in, uh, I believe it was Lake Geneva, and she was stabbed to death by an anarchist. So she had a, she had a very sad end, but she's a very popular figure in history, and uh, um, I know uh, Germany, at least, has made a whole slew of sissy, sissy movies that you can see about her, about her history. I'm jumping away from the bridges, and for a moment I want to mention another Elizabeth of Hungary, but this, she has nothing to do with the bridges. She was the wife of a king. She came originally from uh, Thuringen in Germany, and she lived a very, very humble life and did a great deal for the poor, and the royal palace frowned upon her doing so much work for the poor and as legend have it one day she was um, taking bread to them and she had hidden it in her apron to some people and her husband was coming back from a hunting party and he said what do you have there what are you hiding in your apron and she opened her apron and a miracle had come to be and she had actually roses in the basket so she did not, was not subject to the wrath of her husband for trying to help these people. So I like that legend. So I wanted to point out this other Elizabeth of Hungary. And this is the last bridge I'm going to show you. This is known as the Freedom Bridge or Sabachog Heed. And it was originally named after Franz Josef, again, the emperor, and um, was built around 1896. And again, the the coat of arms. So each of them just beautiful and very ornate in a different aspect and, a, and, and named after a different part of, of Hungarian history. This is a, obviously Budapest now has a marathon like so many uh, cities in the world and uh, so you could theoretically sign up. It says um, the new, it says they even call themselves the new running capital down here and this would be going across the Freedom Bridge there. This is uh, just another view from from the top of the Freedom Bridge and the Danube and a lot of the boats that go up and down it. Some of them are even hotels where you can spend the night. This is a, still on the Pest side. This is a massive covered market known as the Vashar Charnok where you can not only purchase groceries but you can also eat and find souvenirs and browse for hours. This would be looking at the inside and down at the stalls here. and. Um, these would be tubes of um, goulash cream, where if you were making what we pronounce it as goulash, you could add that. Or there's also paprika, you know, the, the paprika cream that you could use in your cooking. Um, these are some of the famous sausages of Hungary, especially the pig salami hanging up here, which when thinly sliced, okay, you know, it's loaded with fat and salt, but it's really, really delicious. So these would be the sausages. These would be some of the famous Hungarian uh, peppers. And this would be an assortment of liqueurs that are being offered and sold. 
and this a um, Hungary has some um, absolutely magnificent wines and this particular wine Tokai is from the middle part of the country and Hungarians proudly call it the king of wines and the wine of kings and it's in various uh, uh, degrees of, of sweetness it's a dessert wine Tokai it's also a region in the country so Let's see, we're going to go, we've crossed over the chain bridge now, and we're on Clark Square here, named for either the engineer or the constructor of the chain bridge. And there's a little funicular here that goes up to the castle district. It only takes three minutes, but it's a lot of fun. And it was originally built for the clerks who worked in the castle district so that they could get to work quickly. And you can take the funicular up to the castle district and this would be, uh, if you were in the funicular, you're up here and you're looking back down over to the Pest side, you're looking over the chain bridge and the river and you've come up, you've come up the hill now. So what do we have up in the castle district? Of course we have the former castle, which is now home to the National Art Museum and the, um, the History Museum. The castle is juxtaposed so that looking from the castle to the parliament, you've got the Danube in between and uh, both clearly visible when standing on one side looking across to the other. It's no, as of 1918, it was not used uh, for royalty anymore as of the end of World War I. And uh, again, we are up here right now. We are up here right now in this castle district area up here in the nucleus of Buda, the hilly side of the city. This would have been the castle district again at the end of World War II, fierce raging between the Soviets and the Germans who were withdrawing. And this is illuminated at night. You've got the, the palace here and you've got St. Matthew's Church over here in the background. And St. Matthew's Church, a bird's eye view up here. St. Matthew was a Renaissance king he was a very learned man. He had four to 5,000 books in his library, most of them in Greek or in Roman, and brought the Renaissance, in essence, to Hungary. And this church was originally named after the Virgin Mary, but it was renamed Matthew's Church in the 19th century. It was um, when the Turkish occupation came to Hungary, they were there for 150 years. And when they conquered Buda in 1541, this church became the main mosque. So the ornate interior was not ornate anymore. It was just very plain, but that's all been restored since then. And what you're seeing in front of it here is called the Fisherman's Bastion. There are seven turrets or towers representing the seven tribes that came into the Carpathian Basin. And when you're, you walk up some steps and you look out over the Danube and you look out over to Pest, it's a very panoramic, panoramic view. I'm, I believe that it was given the name Fisherman's Bastion because it was the Fisherman's Guild in the Middle Ages. This was their section of the city wall to defend. Legend also has it that hot oil was poured upon the Turkish invaders from this vantage point. I don't know whether that's true. It could, it could have been true. This is again St. Matthew's Cathedral. This is the statue of St. Stephen that we saw earlier. And uh, Matthew, by the way, the last two coronations of Hungarian kings, one would have been, of course, Franz Josef, who would have been crowned once in Vienna and then again in Budapest. And then King Charles IV in 1916, he would have been the last uh, emperor to have been crowned. Again, no more royalty after the end of World War I. Matthew's, uh, this, is a, this is a side view of the church, and his symbol was a raven. He's also known as Matthias Corvinus, Corvinus meaning raven in Latin. There are two legends. One says that um, a raven stole the ring after his finger, and he ran off and, and uh, got it back. And at another time, his mother was looking for him, so she sent the raven to go and find him whatever, it's, it's folklore, but his, he's up on the top of one of the spires. The raven is up there, the symbol, the symbol of Matthew. He himself had two wives, he married twice, and both his marriages took place inside this church. And the roof, I, I had said that Herond is the national, uh, number one national porcelain in Hungary. The number two company would be Zsolnai, and these are all Zsolnai roof tiles that adorn the roof of St. Matthew's Cathedral. There are a couple of other buildings up in the castle district, like the National Archives, that also have the Zsolnai porcelain on the roof. This is the inside of the church, which has been restored to its full beauty now. 
This is another cafe, not grand like Cafe New York or Gerbeau, but the Rusform Cafe, um, founded way back in the early 1800s. Another very popular stop up in the Castle District and the cases of delicacies. And over here, many different kinds of Samos marzipan, which is the Hungarian national marzipan, which is very tasty and they're very proud of it. So again, another stop, another must, if you, if you will, and if you're so inclined. So, and then this is, this is hard to see, but so I have understood from my husband that Hungarians and Austrians are always arguing about who invented strudel. But I have to tell you when you're in Hungary and you get this strudel with a crispy thin crust and this absolutely delicious dark cherry, uh, sour cherry, it has to be sour cherry filling, and they call it retesh. And there are many, many different kinds of retesh. And so that's another must there. And this is a, a piece of chocolate cake beckoning just to be purchased and, and consumed. So the Rusform Cafe. And this would be Shomloi Galushka, which is another famous Hungarian dessert. Remember, I told you you're not going there to, um, to, uh, to go on a diet. But there's a lot of walking that you can do. So you can balance that out. This is uh, Gellert up here, St. Gellert. This is also moving away from the Castle District, but up in the hilly side. He's standing up there raising a cross. He was employed by King Stephen to be the tutor for his son Emmerich. And after Stephen's death, I had said that he had a measure of peace during his reign with establishing Christianity throughout the land. There were people who did not agree with this, so there were decades of civil war after his death. And Gellert, unfortunately, fell prey to this. Here he is. There's his, uh, his statue there. And there he is looking out, holding the Christian uh, cross up to the city and he, according to the legend, he was put in um, uh, um, a horrible uh, nail studded barrel and rolled uh, down the hill into the Danube. He was canonized in 1083 along with Stephen and his son, all three of them at the same time. Gellert's Hill, very popular for hikes and if you're into climbing a little bit up to that height, you could do that. This is the Citadella, which is um, going up just a little bit higher from where St. Gellert is pictured. It's a fortress that was constructed during Austrian times. And this statue right here is a massive statue of a lady on a pedestal. It's the Freedom Statue. She herself is 14 meters tall, and the pedestal there is uh, 26 meters tall. So it's quite, it's quite high, as you can imagine. And she's holding a palm leaf to signify peace. You can see the Buddha hills behind her. And she's very visible throughout the city. This was another statue that was put up uh, just after World War II to give thanks to the Soviet liberators. But the wording on the statue has been slightly changed since that time. It doesn't necessarily thank the Soviet liberators uh, anymore for freeing them from the oppression of Nazi tyranny, but it's a symbol of all who fought for Hungary, Hungary's freedom over, over the years. So this would be the freedom statue. And I have two more things I want to show you. Um, this is Statue Park, just a hop, skip, and a jump, literally practically still in the city, but on the outskirts. And this is where all the communist statues were taken. The communist rule again, 1949 to 1989. But instead of destroying them, they brought, this to, they brought them to this outdoor park because they are, after all, 40 years of the country and the city's history. And so you can go there and get a brochure and go around and look at some of them. And for instance, this might be the 1919 uh, communist revolt. You can tell from the, um, the uniforms and the lances that these aren't modern times. You might see this would have been typical Soviet architecture of the proletariat worker, maybe rushing to defend uh, whatever. Um, you would recognize Marx and Engels, who are depicted here, who stood somewhere in Budapest at the time. And you would see Vladimir Lenin. The man you would not see here, here's his head, is the despised dictator Joseph Stalin. There was a massive statue to Stalin in Budapest. It was erected in 1951, and it was a, quote, a gift, unquote, to Joseph Stalin by the Hungarian people on his 70th birthday. I'm sure it was not thought of by the Hungarian people, but by their Soviet rulers at the time. And it also was very tall. Um, he was eight meters tall, and the podium was nine meters. And it was right near where the communist leaders would watch the military parades that took place 
on certain dates in the year. The enraged crowds when the October Revolution started in 1956 on October 23rd, uh, were so anxious to bring down this statue that they toppled it. This head is not in existence anymore, but a Hungarian um, artist uh, replicated his boots, and so you see only his boots in Statue Park up on a pedestal, and that piece of art is called the Grand Stand. So he's there, but he's not there. And uh, I can understand why his statue was tap toppled if you look at the history of the country. And then the last thing I want to show you is we're going, uh, this is an aerial view, we're going north in Buda, actually to Obuda, and you're looking down at Akvinkum. I had said that the Romans came and settled in Hungary, in Budapest. It was their outlying province of the Roman uh, Empire. They conquered a people called the Pannons and named their province Pannonia which for some reason is the name of a cheese in Hungary that you can buy today, Pannonia. So, but this is Akvinkum, and you can tour Akvinkum, and you can walk around and learn how the Romans lived at that time. So the last thing I want to tell you is that you'll always hear the bells ring at 12 noon in Hungary, and this is going all the way back to around 1240. There was a battle, a siege of a town, Nandor Fehervar, or they call it the Battle of Belgrade, because Mehmet II, the Ottoman Sultan, was trying to push his forces in to conquer Hungary, but the Hungarian forces led by a nobleman named Janos Hunyadi were able to resist and keep them back. Eventually the Turks did some 70, 80 years later get to Budapest, and as we all know, they were stopped at the gates of Vienna from moving any further into the western part of Europe. But um, uh, you'll, it, it's always said from that time on that uh, Hungary had managed to keep the Ottoman Turks at bay, and so when the bells ring at noon, you can think uh, all the way back to those uh, to that to that battle and why it's done. So this is my presentation, and I hope that you've liked it and that you've learned something. Um, I am open to uh, questions. We have a microphone here that we can pass if anyone would like to ask a question or make a comment, or if you're Hungarian and you agree or disagree with something that I said. Um, but anyway, thank you for coming on this rainy night. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, would you like to ask a question or say something? Or you're just, you just happen to be holding the microphone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How does the money work there? How you know, does the money work? Yeah, like a dollar in our Oh, right, you're going to ask me that. Okay, what is the conversion rate? Yeah. How much do you know right now? Yeah, it's around uh, 300 dollars. Uh, I mean, 300 forints. 300 forints to the dollar. So if you were traveling here. 300 to one dollar. Okay. You would have to multiply. You have to be right? careful because <laughs> You can spend a lot of money without knowing how much you're spending. Oh, yeah. That's 300 to a dollar. Oh, let's get it. Let's get it. So that would be coins? I mean, that would be they or have bills? Paper. Paper. Oh, yeah, they have bank cards also. Oh. Yes, yes. They had the foreign, and years ago they had the pengu, which would be like our dollar and cent. But with inflation, the poor little pengu doesn't, has gone out of existence. So I had showed you the one banknote with St. Stephen's crown on it. So yeah, banknotes are very, very common. And uh, I didn't know the exact exchange rate right now. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Hi, first of all, I want to congratulate you. I really enjoyed this presentation. You just did Thank a wonderful you. job. Thank you. Um, I was there last October. Mm. I did mm -hmm. a Viking river cruise oh, starting mm -hmm. in Germany, mm -hmm. Vienna, ending up in Budapest. Mm -hmm. However, um, in October, the water in the Danube was so low that we couldn't cruise the whole river. Oh. So we yeah. had to be bussed. We, you know, we were on the ship every night and slept there, but we had to be bussed from town, which took away some of our time in Budapest. Oh. And I was very disappointed in that because it was so beautiful. Yes. Weather yes. was great. We mm. had lovely um, tour guides, you know, mm -hmm. but our time was very limited. Mm. I had signed up for an optional tour to do one of the baths, mm -hmm. 
Mm. And I was the only one on the whole ship that wanted to do oh. that. <laughs> oh. So oh. I would have had a one-to-one -one guide, but there yes. was not enough time. That tour was canceled, oh, and I didn't get t to do that. Yes. But so many of what you showed, we saw, you know, on this limited tour, the bridges, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think the only souvenir I bought was some paprika. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's a good souvenir. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But I would recommend if anybody gets an opportunity to go because it really was. Yes, yeah. I would agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I also want to congratulate you, Maria. You did a Thank wonderful you. job. Thank you. Especially, you know, since my husband here was part of that Hungarian Revolution. Mm -hmm. He was 14 when it happened and he mm -hmm. was right in the middle of it. And everything you said, you know, yes. is the way it was. So yes. you did a wonderful job. Thank you. you want Thank to say you. Something? Yeah. You know, I was born and grew up in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And you said some things I never knew about Budapest. <laughs> so I want to <laughs> congratulate you for that. One thing I'd like to add is uh, it would be very interesting to Americans who are probably familiar with the name of Houdini. His father was the rabbi at the synagogue Houdini? when it was Houdini's built. Father. Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't know that. I believe his name was Weiss. Yeah, I see. Was Weiss. Yeah. I yeah, see. Was oh, Weiss, really? Yeah. Uh, oh, it's something I didn't and he know. He was the rabbi. At mm -hmm. the he uh, he was the chief rabbi. There's a street going down next well the next block over mm -hmm. and side street was the old synagogue mm -hmm. and that's where the jews would meet mm -hmm. and the father was the rabbi mm -hmm. and then they decided to build this new one and his father was in charge of hmm. the construction before they came here mm -hmm. well thank you i appreciate that thank you I just want to comment that uh, it's, it's been quite a few years since I was there last, but if you get an opportunity to go to the Tokai region, uh, you can go into the, um, like the areas carved into the mountain there where you can, the caves, and you can mm. uh, drink from casks that have been there for hundreds of years, if not more. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the wine there is just amazing if you like wine. Mm -hmm. And then I won't bore you with all the other details of the other things I did there, but there's a lot to do there and you'll have a lot of fun. Well, don't forget the Champs Elysees in Budapest. I mean, if you go shopping, yes, you have yes. to go on that street. <laughs> yes, the little pedestrian yes. street ending yes. at Vrudos Martitir, where yes, you saw the are, statue yeah, of the poet and the Gerbo Cafe. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. My, my great-grandfather came from Hungary. Mm -hmm. And I knew nothing about much of it. And we were at Ellis Island about six years ago. Mm -hmm. I did know his full name, his middle name also. Um, they have computers there. And I put into the computer his name. Mm -hmm. And out came the ship that he came over on and it had a bill of laden of which told what he had with him. So many sausages, so many loaves of bread, a, a certain amount of cheese, mm -hmm. some long underwear, some pants and shirts. That's, that's what he came over with. Oh, that's great. <laughs> he worked his way from New York to um, Pennsylvania, at the eastern end of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. earned enough money to go back and brought my grandfather back with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And both of my grandparents were Hungarian. I have understood that a great deal went to the coal mines in Pennsylvania. In fact, the William Penn Society, uh, the Hungarian uh, yeah. was founded for the miners to help their conditions, right, right and give them a, a framework for their existence there. My so grandmother been, also yeah. came from Hungary, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she worked in the courts because she could speak English, mm 
mm. Polish, Czechoslovakian, mm-hmm. and Hungarian. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was a real plus. Yes, mm-hmm. that's yes. how they earned money, you know. Yes. I wonder, I suppose the USDA was not really so strict at that time with letting the sausages into the country. <laughs> Today they'd be confiscated, you know. That little beagle would be running around sniffing your suitcase and you'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well, thank you. And thank, thank you. you to Mr. Heber for filming. Yeah, okay. Thank you for coming. Yeah.